All right, thank you very much. So uh, I am Larry O'Neill, and I'm from Oregon State University, and I'm joined online here by Hiode Seo from Woods Hole. And uh, first, I want to thank Fire for uh, supporting our working group. Um, so we found out a few weeks, uh, weeks ago that we received approval um, to go ahead with the working group, and we're quite excited to get ramped up on uh, the activities. So the uh, purpose today uh, is just to introduce um, our working group and uh, introduce the science questions that we have and are hoping to address and what our initial plans are going forward. So um, the focus of this working group is just to formulate and coordinate uh, observational modeling efforts uh, to understand air-sea coupled processes better and how uh, they impact Earth's climate. So today, um, what we mean by mesoscale is usually, uh, it's, it's a length scale, uh, it's usually defined by ocean variability. Um, we typically think of it as scales somewhere between 50 and 1,000 kilometers, although that's not uh, a tight restriction. And uh, I want to note that the lower bound of uh, 50 kilometers is typically um, the resolution limitation right now for global atmospheric ocean uh, coupled models and also from satellite observations as well that we use to both force the models and to evaluate their um, evaluate them. Um, so just the outline, uh, we're just going to give a, a background and a very brief motivation of some of the outstanding science questions that we're going to uh, address with our working group and how we're going to organize the working group to help best address those questions. Uh, we have a few uh, examples of um, uh, ongoing projects that will help um, that some of the working group members are involved in. And then uh, we're going to finish by just um, uh, giving uh, uh, a plan for our working group meetings and activities and also for our suggested uh, membership as well. So the key objectives, um, I put four of them on here. And the first one is, uh, is to provide a plan for in-situ and satellite observations um, how we can use them to optimally sample uh, the spatial and temporal scales that are necessary to study uh, mesoscale air sea interactions and coupling, and how best to um, evaluate model simulations uh, to see how well they're doing and how well they can predict, for instance, seasonal to sub seasonal um, weather phenomena. Um, this working group also uh, kind of came out of the uh, Clivar. Uh, working group on eddy atmosphere interactions and the Clivar workshop that was held in February 2018 in Portland, Oregon. And um, that working group was uh, uh, devoted to looking at uh, the this, um, impacts of mesoscale eddies, ocean eddies on the atmosphere and how those uh, coupled feedbacks uh, play out. And that, was, that involves a lot of uh, model intercomparisons and evaluations of observations and things like that. And so we're going to um, broaden the focus of that, uh, of that workshop and um, add in um, another component, which is kind of the large-scale um, impact on the uh, Earth's climate. And to do this, we're going to um, uh, focus on the third bullet point here um, to motivate and foster um, both modeling component and an observationally-based component. And what this will do is we're going to um, uh, discuss how to best um, uh, define diagnostics for the coupling and how we can use uh, diagnostics in both in both like satellite and in situ observations and also in global uh, models. And so how can we evaluate the coupling? How can we tell um, how well the models are doing? And also um, if the models can help uh, motivate um, different uh, satellite sampling characteristics things like that. And finally, um, we'd like to, um, right now is kind of an exciting time for this uh, field as there, um, the uh, capabilities in both observations and modeling are advancing fairly rapidly. And so we'd like to identify uh, what consensus there is on key interactions that are important and also where the uncertainties lie. So what kind of things uh, do we um, still not understand very well? And then what kind of observations do we need to help uh, bridge that gap, what kind of modeling studies do we need, um, things like that. <clears throat> so uh, next couple of slides, I wanted to kind of motivate just the science questions a little bit with some, um, just a couple of um, recent studies that have, um, that have 
kind of advanced our understanding and also opened up more questions. So uh, one thing is over the Gulf Stream in the North Atlantic, uh, Manobi et al. in 2008 is a very, uh, very well-known uh, influential nature paper that showed that the Gulf Stream um, can influence um, the um, and a, a very uh, localized atmospheric response, um, particularly in precipitation and storms. And what I've shown here are two maps from this paper. Uh, one is from a, a global climate model um, at the top, and it's forced with a realistic SST field, so there's a lower boundary condition. And so it contains a lot of these uh, mesoscale structures that um, are that uh, we believe exist there, and the forcing that comes along with that. And the, con the uh, shading shows the, um, the density of cyclones over the Gulf Stream. So the warmer colors became more cyclones, colder colors less. And uh, it's fairly well known that um, storms and cyclones uh, tend to track very closely to the, uh, the strongest SST gradients over the Gulf Stream. And what they did was very interesting is they took uh, the, the SST boundary condition and they smoothed it out spatially so that the mesoscale uh, features, most of them are removed from the SST field. They reran the model, and um, the bottom panel shows the uh, cyclone density uh, that they get from that. And you can see that um, rather than being localized over the path of the Gulf Stream, it's now more diffuse over the whole Atlantic. So the key point here is that the, uh, that the simulations of storm tracks um, and precipitation that go along with it are quite sensitive to the inclusion of mesoscale features in the SST field. Um, now this link with the, SS, the mesoscale SST field and precipitation is um, there's becoming, uh, there's a, quite a bit more evidence to suggest um, that there's a link between it and that there, the link may not be local as the last paper suggested, but may actually influence the downstream um, precipitation uh, storminess blocking highs and things like that. And so there's this paper that was from uh, Ma et al. 2015 in Science Reports. And uh, what they did was they took uh, satellite SST, or I'm sorry, satellite uh, rain estimates over the uh, North Pacific Ocean. And they uh, composite average, uh, did a composite based on whether the Kuroshio was in a state of very active eddy. Um, so they had a lot of eddies, or years where the Kuroshio did not have uh, very active eddies, which they called an inactive eddy state. And the top panel shows the difference between those composites, between the active and inactive eddy years. And uh, so you can see that there is actually, um, in the observations, quite a large difference in rain rates um, throughout the Pacific Basin uh, between these two years. Um, even influencing the North uh, North American coast. So it's actually a quite interesting result. Um, so what this uh, study points to is uh, that there's uh, an association between uh, mesoscale SST distribution in the Kuroshio and the downstream precipitation into uh, North America. They also went on to show that there was also um, uh, consistent uh, impacts on the location of the storm track and the, uh, uh, the jet stream within the Pacific as well. So there is um, certainly uh, some sort of non-local um, association between the uh, mesoscale SST field and the atmospheric circulation. So we actually put this at question mark up here because um, this study actually raises a lot of questions more than it answers anything. Uh, one of them is that they show an association, but the, the causal mechanism isn't, isn't, isn't quite clear because the SST field can uh, induce an atmospheric response, which can feed back onto the mesoscale SST field itself. Um, and one one thing that might suggest that is they also ran simulations with a, a, a high-resolution mesoscale model over the North Pacific, um, which I've shown here on this bottom panel. Uh, this is a WARF simulation. And um, so they ran it the same way during active and inactive years and the difference, and the, the simulated difference in the rain rate is quite different than what it is in the observations. And um, so that raises a host of questions, um, which I won't necessarily get into here, but the key points I want to make is that, you know, what are the models missing um, from this? Is it, um, is it something the models are not doing correctly? Are we missing feedback? So 
this model simulation was an atmospheric only simulation, so it misses uh, feedbacks between the atmospheric circulation and the SST field. So uh, that might be something that's important to think about here. Um, but the other, uh, the other key point I want to make, which will be something that's a, a kind of a key uh, principle in our working group, is what are the implications for the sub-seasonal to seasonal predictability? So it's uh, often called S2S. And so essentially we want to know, you know, what does the mesoscale SST field mean for uh, forecasting, uh, you know, seasonal type uh, precipitation patterns and atmospheric circulation. Um, another key feature, so uh, we talk about precipitation quite a bit, but there's also the influence of blocking highs and blocking patterns in the atmosphere, which can actually suppress precipitation in uh, certain parts of the uh, mid-latitudes. And there's a really nice paper, uh, O'Reilly 2016, a recent paper, and that was looking at the influence of the Gulf Stream on um, setting the wintertime uh, blocking of the European continent. And um, so in the, they did some model simulations and they kind of came to a summary, um, a nice summary figure, which I've shown here. So in those left-hand panel here, they show what's called the real Gulf Stream. And what they mean by the real Gulf Stream is a uh, Gulf Stream with realistic SST patterns with all its mesoscale SST glory included in there. And what they found was that in that um, sort of setup, you get a, a very um, a concentrated uh, mean rain rates kind of along the Gulf Stream or slightly um, equatorward of the Gulf Stream, which is consistent with observations. But they also found that this eddy, uh, that the um, large-scale atmospheric circulation forms this uh, quasi-stationary jet pattern that um, there's a trough more over the western Atlantic and then the strong ridge over the eastern Atlantic. And the strong ridge is a blocking pattern that um, they showed uh, influences the temperature, precipitation, um, et cetera, in uh, the European continent. Uh, they did some model simulations where they smoothed out the Gulf Stream, and they found that uh, consistent with the earlier Minovi study was that the precipitation was far more diffuse and weaker, and the um, eddy jets or the uh, large-scale atmospheric prep pattern shifted um, eastward that the trough was centered more in the central Atlantic, and then the ridge, the blocking high, moved uh, further downstream. And the, uh, in the simulated climate and this sort of, um, uh, using this smooth SST distribution was much different. Um, so, <clears throat> and the main point here is that the mechanism for the blocking frequency is not just due to um, the uh, North Atlantic jets in the atmosphere, but um, it also had to do with storm dynamics, and these storm dynamics are strongly shaped in the Atlantic by the Gulf Stream SST distribution, and uh, specifically the mesoscale SST variability. So uh, this is something that will uh, um, is quite important. Now, talking about the SST fields, um, so when you do these smooth versus unsmooth SST experiments, and you see these models have a great sensitivity to it, um, you can also ask the question is, um, are the SST fields that we're using to force these models, are they sufficient to, um, you know, to, to get a good idea of what the, the climate and the ocean atmosphere coupling are? And um, so there have been a number of papers that have looked at the resolution capabilities of commonly used SST uh, re -anal or analysis fields. And uh, there's a paper here by Martin et al. in 2010 that show 11 common uh, SST analysis fields that are available on daily time scales. Uh, these all are based on observations, either uh, infrared or microwave satellites, and uh, a number of they all slightly handle or they all handle in situ observations slightly differently, if at all. Um, and rather than point out any particular one, the main point I want to he show here by showing 11 uh, maps is that each of these SST fields are, are fairly different. Um, a couple of features that are different are the, the Gulf Stream along the, uh, the, the southeast U.S. coast. Um, some here, the uh, SST gradients are quite weak. Oh, I should also mention that the colors here show the SST gradient magnitude. So this, um, this just shows how sharp the fronts are in the SST analysis field. And these maps show just uh, a one-day example. <clears throat> um, a couple other features that are also um, not that differ between the products are these uh, the secondary SST fronts. 
um, that are that's more um, inshore of the Gulf Stream and then the, the main uh, SST front along the Gulf Stream. And then just this general strength and um, pattern of small-scale variability within it are all uh, fairly different in here. So, um, so one of the challenges for a working group is to um, that we'd like to address is to is to find out how this change in SST forcing, or that's uh, depicted by these various SST fields, um, how does it affect our ability to be able to, uh, you know, diagnose the ERC coupling processes and also to uh, predict um, seasonal and uh, sub-seasonal weather patterns as well. And um, so, as I said before, there's evidence emerging that the uh, that the mesoscale SST fields uh, influences the large scale weather on uh, seasonal and sub seasonal time scales. Um, a lot of focus has been put on the local atmospheric response. So, what I mean by local is that if you have an SST front at a place, that there's an atmospheric response that overlies that SST gradient. However, there's uh, there's quite a bit of evidence showing uh, clearly that there's non local influences. So, there are downstream impacts possibly upstream impacts um, on the mid-latitude storm track. Um, and these, uh, it's a, a very active area of research right now, and uh, there's still quite a lot of questions um, that we uh, don't clearly understand. But we believe it's a, a quite an important uh, process to understand the ocean-atmosphere coupling that occurs um, both in a local sense and a non-local sense. And um, these studies all raise questions about um, what the accuracy and resolution requirements we need for an SST boundary condition if you're forcing an atmosphere-only model. And um, and this question has not been, um, uh, is, is not been uh, looked at very much. So, and finally, um, the, there are still some open questions about physical mechanisms that are governing the coupling um, on the mesoscale. And these um, questions are Kind of been hampered to a certain extent by the um, different SST uh, fields that we have, uh, different models, um, different diagnostic frameworks, and things like that. And this working group will, um, we'd like to be able to um, help um, kind of uh, get a common framework for looking at this and to make some progress on this that isn't dependent on these other things. Um, so the, uh, our uh, working group, we have several members who are going to be engaged in field experiments that we believe will help um, get, uh, provide in situ observations or um, other, um, other types of information that will be relevant to the working group. Um, this working group, uh, this field experiment here is the atomic uh, that's happening in the Northwest Tropical Atlantic um, next year. And I believe Hiode is uh, involved in this one. And it's essentially going to um, look, they have some science questions to try to address our understanding of the ocean atmosphere coupling and the, um, uh, some specific processes that are happening on the uh, ocean mesoscale. And um, they're going to look specifically at impacts on the vertical mix in the ocean, gravitation, and uh, the wind work. So the difference between the winds and ocean currents, and then how uh, boundary layer clouds and precipitation patterns are affected by the coupling as well. Um, so besides the SST coupling that we've, uh, um, we've focused on, so SST, on the mesoscale, the SST can affect the atmosphere through the surface turbulent heat fluxes, the sensible and latent heat flux. Um, something else that's also become apparent, in, uh, particularly in the last 10 years, is that surface currents can also affect the surface wind stress, and then this, this can feed back onto the ocean mesoscale field. Um, not only eddies, but also on other mesoscale features and, and funnel features as well. And Hyode did a study here where uh, he forced a model with um, taking into account the effect of ocean currents on the surface wind stress. That's what's shown here on the center. And the shading here is the eddy kinetic energy um, of the model. And on the right-hand panel here is when you do not account for uh, small-scale ocean currents on the in the surface wind stress formulation. And what you can see is that um, when you include surface currents um, in the surface wind stress, which is more realistic physically, um, you have a much uh, uh, much reduced eddy kinetic energy field. 
And the main point here is that the um, by a lot of models don't include the uh, surface currents effect on the surface wind stress, and so that's um, so its uh, mesoscale field in the ocean evolves much differently than it does if you do include the surface current effect on the stress. And so this, um, including surface currents um, in the stress, um, may be a very important process for understanding how the ocean mesoscale field evolves, which will feed back onto the SST field, which then will influence the atmosphere. Um, the importance of surface currents um, is is now becoming a little bit uh, more recognized. Uh, there are two satellite missions that have been proposed. One is uh, the Europeans are proposing a SKIM, what's called SKIM, and uh, actually today is when they're uh, scheduled to decide whether or not the missions can go forward. There's also a US-led um, effort uh, called WACOM, which is still in uh, planning stages and hasn't fully been approved yet, but uh, NASA has funded uh, recently um, this uh, EBS proposal um, to do a field experiment on the California coast called S-Mode. So it's going to be uh, focused on the sub-mesoscale dynamics. But it, they'll be using a, a, a Doppler scat, which is an airboard-mounted uh, Doppler scatterometer that can measure ocean currents. And one of the sci main science questions that they're going to address is the role of surface currents in air-sea coupling and how it feeds back onto the ocean um, mesoscale field. And that's something that I'll be involved in and a few other uh, uh, planned members. So uh, one of the key activities we'll be doing um, with our working group is to um, develop a strategy for a mesoscale grand challenge where we have a multi-model intercomparison experiment. Um, so we'll identify some models, um, some common uh, forcing conditions, and then uh, also um, identify um, a set of observations and diagnostic tools to um, evaluate the RC coupling in both observations and the models. Um, so this, uh, this effort will um, leverage in part the uh, high-res MIP um, intercomparison project that's going on right now. Um, they have um, several high-resolution global models that are available um, online to, uh, to use, and so we plan uh, to try to leverage uh, this existing effort um, going forward. Uh, the second activity um, that we're um, proposing is to uh, construct a, uh, a framework for diagnostic met and metrics and statistical methods for um, analyzing the models and observations and apply these to a coordinated set of model experiments and observational verification data. So the observational data will include satellite data and hopefully in situ data from some of these other um, in situ model or in situ uh, field campaigns. And then um, at the end, we, uh, we plan to uh, share, the, uh, share this data and put it in a common format for everyone on the working group to analyze and also for others to evaluate as well. Um, so the third key activity is um, we'll have a yearly update to the AGU and planning sessions and community workshops, uh, and a community workshop to uh, synthesize these results and, um, and keep planning directions forward based on um, our results previous. So our first formal working group meeting will be at the uh, 2020 AG Ocean Sciences meeting in San Diego. Um, and beyond that, in 2021, uh, we will organize a 50 participant workshop, either uh, Oregon State or HUI. And the uh, last activity um, that we'll talk about today is um, we hope to um, uh, take all this new knowledge and information we have and to uh, hopefully write three synthesis papers um, looking at diagnostic metrics, uh, the modeling framework, and then um, the uh, demonstrates um, state-of-the-art modeling techniques and uh, comparisons with observations as well. Um, one of the last slides we have is uh, we have a suggested working group membership, and um, so we uh, we just got uh, received approval uh, three weeks ago or a couple weeks ago to um, that our working group was going forward. So our plan is to um, 
contact uh, the suggested members that you see here. And um, we have a, a number of alternates as well, if that doesn't have. Uh, one thing I'd like to point out is we have a, a variety of um, expertise on here, from observational to modeling. And so we've got a lot of the uh, processes here that we believe are important. And we also have a variety of um, career tracks and um, uh, we also have uh, uh, international members as well. <clears throat> so um, just a work plan for the upcoming year is that our team building, um, we're working on that right now. And by the end of July, we hope to have the working group uh, mostly filled out. And um, we'll have our first working group telecon uh, early September or late August. And um, where we begin to um, deliberate on our tasks. And um, Within, uh, towards the end of 2020, we'd like to uh, start our first uh, review paper on um, some of the synthesis things we have. Um, we also have a related activity at Ocean Sciences Meeting. Um, uh, we are chairing a session um, on essentially this topic. And um, finally, we'd like to have an AGU or Ocean Sciences Town Hall to encourage uh, broader community engagements in our efforts. So um, anyway, so that's our introduction. So if you have any questions, uh, please contact us. You have our email addresses here. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. And uh, I just want to show in the background here is a, 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 a satellite SST image that shows lots of mesoscale and submesoscale variability. So this is sort of the stuff that we'd like to look at. Anyway, thank you. Thank you, Larry. Uh, we have a few minutes for questions. So do we have any questions for them on this working group? Reminder is to use the raise your hand feature and I'll take you off mute or you can type it in the chat box. Okay, I see a question from Charlotte. Let me see. All right, I believe I unmuted you, Charlotte. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, thanks for this nice talk. I was curious if you have any thoughts on some preliminary types of diagnostics you plan to use for this working group. Um, we do. Uh, one in particular, um, there's uh, Nicholas Schneider, who uh, uh, we're going to have in the working group, hopefully. Um, he's written uh, one paper and is coming out with a second one on um, a framework for looking at the coupling um, based on uh, basically wave number space. Mm -hmm. And um, so to doing a kind of a spectral analysis, uh, so look at the wave number dependence of the coupling. Um, it, he's been able to apply this both to observations to um, idealize numerical uh, analytical models and then also to um, uh, numerical models as well. So like uh, uh, NCEP, for instance, the reanalysis fields. Um, so that's actually a, a very promising technique that we hope to use. Thank you. Any other questions? Let's see, Patrick has a question. I'll take you off mute. All right, go ahead, Patrick. All right. Thank you very much. Very uh, great presentation. I was just you mentioned a lot about the, um, or at least a little bit about the downstream effects uh, for the Gulf Stream and the Kuro Show. I was wondering if, for the Gulf Stream in particular, are there any papers out there, since I'm not familiar with that, that look at how the Gulf Stream may affect the storms that end up getting into the Arctic? So, do you know? What, uh, can you provide any more information about how that downstream effects could impact the Arctic? Yeah. You um, Dave, you know. Uh, do you have an answer to this? Yeah, so I, um, I'm i not aware of any paper that look at the connection between, say, Gulf Stream front and Arctic stominis. Um, it's an interesting question. I think most papers that I'm aware of tend to focus on downstream, so either northern Europe or uh, western uh, European coast, uh, how the weather patterns change due to the circulation, the jet stream shift. Um, I believe that the, the response is in the storm track or jet stream isn't that strong uh, to Gulf Stream SST you know, in a way that you know, storm track can be shipped all the way to, you know, uh, into a higher latitude in the North Atlantic. Uh, but I think that's an interesting question because there could be a, some telecollection pattern that the projection 
in, uh, response can be projected onto some sort of NAO or article oscillation. Um, so there are, there are a lot of modeling studies that look, explore these teleconnection patterns. So, um, but question is, problem is always the signal to noise ratio, because you are forcing the system with the very small SST anomalies and gradients. Um, so uh, you need a, re a relatively large ensemble members to be able to say something about the robustness of the response. All right, thank you. Um, actually, I had one other um, one other thing I was thinking of too is the uh, there's some of the, the ideas that a little bit controversial, but the idea about the waviness of the of the jet stream, like the maybe some of the stuff Jennifer Francis has looked at, um, we will definitely um, yeah that will definitely be a, a something we will think about because if we were are running these models globally um, and we have near global satellite observations, it, it should be something we could pick up on. Yeah, I'd be very interested in that. I mean, the stuff that Jennifer Francis and others have been doing is more what's the impact of the Arctic on the waviness of the jet, not necessarily how are mid-latitude uh, ocean atmosphere interactions influencing the jet that then impact the Arctic, right? So I'm yeah. thinking more from how's the mid-latitudes impacting the Arctic changes or potentially changing the frequency or intensity with which the polar heat transport is happening. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would definitely look at that. Well, maybe add another wrinkle to it, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Thank you, Patrick. Um, so, to respect everyone's time, I think we will finish there. If they, anyone has any additional questions for Larry or Hyode, uh, you can contact them through the email that's on the screen right now. Um, so, Hyode and Larry, I want to thank you guys for taking your time and presenting on your new working group, and I look forward to uh, collaborating with you guys more. Um, and our next pre-summit webinar is scheduled for this following or this upcoming Monday, July 22nd, at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. And our Water Isotopes Working Group will be will present during that time with Kim Cobb, David Noon, and Adriana Bailey as our co-chairs. Um, so I will send an send an announcement then. All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Hi. Right, thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody.